All right. We'll go ahead and get started. A couple minutes past the hour. Thank you, everyone here in person and online. We see a few of your faces on the Zoom here. So uh, thank you for joining us. My name is Jeff Reesom, um, partner and chief innovation officer here at Gale. Uh, and on behalf of both um, Cities Changing Diabetes and Gale, I'd like to welcome you all to this C40 side event. We'll, we will be talking about foodscapes, food health, and the role between the city and public health. I'll, I have an, an esteemed group up here uh, with me, and we'll be presenting uh, sort of 10 minutes or so of some points of view, and then have a conversation, hopefully, where we can include both folks here in the auditorium and then also, uh, also online. So with that, I'll turn it over to Nils Lund to uh, kick things off for us. Thank you. And uh... Good afternoon. My name is Nils Lund. I'm uh, head of uh, global prevention and health promotion in Novo Nordisk, and also the uh, global lead for cities changing diabetes. Um, welcome everyone, and uh, welcome online. Um, I see a couple of familiar faces, uh, so good to see you. Um, I'm really happy to see us all coming together uh, to discuss the challenges of uh, ensuring equitable access to healthy food. Um, but first, let me just uh, zoom a little bit out and 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 look at the at the current uh, food systems uh, uh, net contribution to society, because it's net negative by a very huge margin. For some of you, it might come as a little bit of a surprise, but I, I like to walk you through the numbers. Last year at the uh, the the scientific committee of the World F Food Systems Summit estimated that the annual societal contribution of total, total food consumption is $9 trillion per year. It's a very big number, but just remember nine. Uh, and, and the net contribution of $9 trillion is, of course, positive. However, uh, the hidden costs are more than double that, uh, valued at an estimated $20 trillion. Health costs are the largest drivers at 11 trillion due to early mortality, uh, due to cardiovascular disease, cancers, diabetes, and associated conditions uh, such as obesity. The uh, environmental costs are 7 trillion, so 11 plus 7, due to the climate change, uh, the, the impact of climate change, loss of biodiversity, depletion of water mortality and disability due to air pollution. And to that, we can add a trillion uh, in costs related to loss of productivity. So the total value of today's food system is a net negative tr 10 trillion uh, US dollars globally. This piece of evidence or this math problem uh, suggests there are strong interlinkages between food, climate and health. And in the nexus, of food, climate, and health, we find inequity because the ones negatively affected by the impact of poor food systems and in inadequate health systems are also the ones that are disproportionately negatively affected by climate events. The ones impacted most negatively are the ones in neighborhoods with poor public utilities on marginal land, in food deserts or food swamps, whatever you want to call them, and where people are facing multiple socioeconomic challenges. Since its inception eight years ago, or slightly more than that, the global public-private partnership Cities Changing Diabetes has worked to understand vulnerability and what drives risk of poor health outcomes in uh, urban settings with a focus on non-communicable diseases, including obesity and diabetes. Today, we work in more than 40 cities around the world to drive change for healthier, more equal and sustainable cities. And we see encouraging actions and innovation when it comes to community development, civil society engagement, healthy urban planning, improved access to healthcare, focused public health interventions, and healthier food systems, actually. And we've been fortunate to uh, have worked with like-minded partners such as C40, uh, where we will spend the time, some of us, uh, late, later this week, to understand the co-benefits of uh, climate and health investments. We've been working with UNICEF to turn the tide on obesity, uh, in, in children, uh, a huge, huge challenge, 
uh, with Gale Architects uh, to understand how uh, human behavior can can and should influence urban planning and city design. And then obviously also the city of Copenhagen, which was one of the first cities to join the program. And uh, I'd like to use this opportunity to thank you for the collaboration uh, so far. Together with city leaders and urban planners around the world, we have, uh, together with Giel, worked to develop and test the so-called Foodscapes Toolkit. And we have just completed in this very room a two-day uh, masterclass here in Buenos Aires and how to bring that alive. Uh, and it'll be exciting to see how the delegations from different places in the Americas will uh, work to implement it uh, in, in the months and, and years to come. And I wish you good luck. I see some familiar faces <laughs> from, from the workshop uh, the other day. The Foodscapes tool probably won't change the big numbers in the math problem I, I talked about a little bit earlier, but it's a practical way to get cities started on improving access to healthy, affordable, culturally appropriate food for vulnerable groups and in disinvested communities. And I'm positive uh, and optimistic that it will make a difference for the people we actually uh, try to serve. I look forward to the discussions this afternoon and would like to hand it back to, to Jeff uh, to, uh, to take us uh, through the session. Thank you again very much uh, for being part of this. Thank you. Thank you, Niels. Definitely sets the sense of urgency of the topic that we're um, discussing both at C40 here this week and also uh, in, in our discussion. Uh, I also want to, you know, really make sure to thank um, not only you and Novo and CCD, but the uh, other participants that have been part of the masterclass that you mentioned, and we'll talk a little bit more about that. I want to um, actually give both Louisa and Ida also a chance to introduce yourself, and um, then I'll present a little bit more about the foodscapes that Neil mentioned. But Louisa, can you tell us who you are? Thank you very much. Um, Louisa Brumana, I'm the UNICEF representative here in Argentina. But in my previous recordation, I was working uh, at the regional office of UNICEF uh, for the Latin American and the Caribbean exactly on this topic. So I'm, I'm really excited to be here uh, in representation uh, of UNICEF. And hello, everybody. My name is Ida Begum, and I'm head of division in the city of Copenhagen in the finance administration, uh, where, among many other things, I also have the responsibility of food strategy work and these collaborations. So thank you for inviting me. Wonderful. So we'll give uh, Louisa and Ida a chance to share some of their work and thoughts in just a moment. In the meantime, I will share my screen here so people in this online and here can see a few slides. Wonderful. All right, in this somewhat uncomfortable situation for a slightly short man like myself up here. Okay, good. So um, this idea of foodscapes is really tied to the notion of how public health and urban design can help ensure that the easy choice for people is actually the healthy choice. As we mentioned, I'm at Gale and live, been living in, uh, based in Copenhagen for the last 20 years, um, but my accent is definitely American and from Colorado. I actually grew up in a little town called Pueblo. Uh, you can see on the left, this is my first childhood home. And as you see the comparison between Pueblo and Copenhagen, obviously it's not a difficult place to uh, decide where to live. So luckily I'm raising my family uh, in Copenhagen. But what's interesting uh, about Pueblo is that the school, that school district that I uh, attended was one of the first in the nation due to budget shortfalls to actually invite for fast food companies and for soft drink companies to both advertise and serve food as the official uh, school meals back in the mid 90s. So that contrast you see on the left with the one on the right, which is uh, the school food program in Copenhagen uh, that my kids uh, are taking part of and Ida will tell you more about, also really illustrate this contrast, both not only of the inequities that exist in different parts of the world, but also how far this discussion has come in the last 25 or 30 years. If we're thinking about foodscapes, of course, we have to begin with humans. 
And as we think about humans as being our client, regardless of where we're working or how, what organization we're working with, we should understand a few fundamental aspects of being human. Uh, we move quite slow. We are very curious and ultimately a social animal where we have a strong desire to connect and share experiences with one another. Oftentimes food can be that connection catalyst. But there's also something that our city shows us as humans. And our hope is the work that we're all a part of can engender and promote a sense of, of that connectivity and of kindness, of civility and really dignified experiences wherever we might find ourselves in the city. These are two images from Buenos Aires on the left in Barrio 31, uh, an informal settlement that's been recently formalized and upgraded. And on the right, one of the many lovely streets in uh, the rest of the city. And I think what's interesting actually in Buenos Aires is a good example of um, many places, Not it's not perfect, but it's quite interesting to see such a, such a lovely and healthy food offer uh, actually in an informal settlement, uh, along with of course, lovely and healthy food offers in the rest of the city. It's not all like this, but there's many examples. So we've been using this word foodscapes now for quite a bit. Um, and what is it? It's actually the intersection of the actual food places, whether that be a restaurant or a cafe or the kiosk I just showed, the physical space, the public space, the street, the square, the park, and the actual life, the humans that are ultimately in the center of um, making food, food choices and spending time in the city. So this three-part um, sort of connection uh, between food and the city sounds maybe a little bit new, but actually, of course, cities and food are inextric inextricably linked. They wouldn't have a city without um, the ability to mass produce food on the outskirts of the city. At the same time, if you see a picture like this from, from London, there's always been a connection, whether it be the paths that farmers and um, folks took with their animals into the city have created the, the roots in cities and the marketplaces where food was sold and distributed also gave people in cities hundreds of years ago an opportunity to be in contact with their food, with their food system and know what they put on their plate later on the day, where it comes from. That changed of course with industrialized food production, allowing cities to grow much, much wider and sprawl out more and more, meaning that people in the city really had no reason or excuse to see where their food actually comes from. That might be part of the reason why we have these incredible figures that Niels mentioned, um, this one about you know 420 million people worldwide having diabetes and cities being the place where not only most of the world's population live, but where three out of four of those 420 million people live. So the issue of the city and food are definitely connected. Many of you have probably seen this also in terms of what promotes health or what actually contributes to our health. It has a lot to do with our behavior, with our physical environment and with social factors more than say particular clinical medical treatment or outcomes. So our environment matters very, very much. Who we spend time with it matters very, very much in our health. And again, this happens in the city. So this is where Gail comes in to this uh, partnership and discussion. We are urban planners, urban designers, architects, anthropologists, ethnog ethnographers who want to study everyday behavior to shape the conditions in which not only communities can thrive, but we're also hopefully people can have uh, healthy access to um, food and other things that make them healthy. So this intersection of urban planning and public health, this is where Gail and Cities Changing Diabetes have been working together. And it's interesting to see where this actual interface happens, right? So it's the place where planning departments give permission for markets to set up shop and begin to sell their goods. It's the locations of food trucks and other mobile vendors that contribute to um, families' everyday habits. It's places where culture uh, can be expressed and celebrated. It's also maybe places where you wouldn't, you don't see sold being, you don't see food being bought or sold, but consumed and even transported from one, um, one place to the other. So th these, these are the interfaces of planning and public health decisions. And over the last four years, uh, Gail and Novo and Cities Changing Diabetes have worked in 
six very different cities, Houston and Bogota, Copenhagen and Philadelphia, and London and Lisbon. And I wanted to show some examples from those places very quickly. So Bogota, uh, if you know it, of course, a quite hilly place, a lot of informality, uh, a mix of geography and topographical challenges, which really make food access quite challenging and quite difficult. In fact, the public realm is definitely where, where people's food choice is determined. And being unable to access food, of course, is somewhat economic, but also very, very much driven by uh, the built environment. So you could even say that the public realm is a larger challenge than cost. And I think for most of us in the room or online, this is a little, a, a little bit surprising, thinking that cost is, of course, important, but these physical barriers like a lack of transportation or safety in particular um, matter even more. So in Bogota, being able to connect these ideas of habits in the home with things like public transit and commuting times gives us a holistic picture of how to deal with the entire human point of view of making everyday food choices and ultimately hopefully an opportunity to improve that those conditions. In London this is very much uh, also a case not too dissimilar from Buenos Aires in terms of the rising uh, amount of childhood obesity and in in London we've seen not only in uh, South London, where you have almost 50% of kids uh, who are actually obese, but throughout the entire UK, you can see very stark statistics of childhood obesity ri rising quite, um, quite rapidly, especially in places that are deprived. And while these big data figures might sort of shock us into action, we get a totally different perspective if we actually spend time talking to the kids themselves. We did that in, in South London and found out that teenagers in particular have very, very few places to spend time. You might have seen that there's you know, new playgrounds for families and young children, but for teens, the cities offer very few options. So bus stops become not only a hanging out point, but also an, essentially an extension of fast food places. So here we've seen a situation where the mayor of London has worked quite hard to ban advertising on bus shelters but hasn't considered the fact that places like McDonald's and many other unhealthy food chains are located right at the bus stop. Again, the only place where teenagers actually spend time. So this sort of Bermuda Triangle of health um, makes it very challenging to eat and live healthier. Copenhagen is a place, again, where we started out by spending time with the very people whose lives we hope to um, improve, so the children themselves. Uh, in Copenhagen, once you turn 12, and mostly throughout Denmark, you can begin to leave the school and go out on your own. And this is a time where kids are setting and creating their own food habits. And when we spent some time with kids in this Copenhagen neighborhood, we found out that they were going to the supermarket two or three times a day. And actually, this short little route that you see here gave us many opportunities to invite for different types of food activities and behavior. So by building new public space, adding in edible plants, making uh, arrangements with food trucks, selling the um, Eat Lancet planetary diet, and many different sort of overlapping of campaigns and, 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 and agreements and design, we could begin to create new invitations for that healthy behavior. And ultimately, this becomes not only an issue of health, but obviously also of uh, CO2 emissions and climate action, also as Niels mentioned. And in, in this case, if we could measure, which we did, how many kids each day ate a little bit a more healthier meal this, this, as part of these uh, interventions, we can actually save a lot of carbon throughout the course of the year. And not only carbon, but also give kids a, a, a chance to, to come in contact with different types of food to begin to change some of their behaviors and again, form this, uh, some of these new patterns that are so key at this point of adolescence and, uh, and teenage life. So what this is really all about is working across these silos of planning and health. It's about empathy, spending time with kids, with low-income folks, with people that real life people in real places, understanding them from a whole person perspective, not only from a pure health or climate perspective. It's about creating environments where the healthy choice is the easy choice, as I mentioned, and uh, ultimately ensuring that while this is very complex and food inside the home might be very difficult to change, we can make a big difference uh, to food that is 
publicly accessible. And Ida will talk more about this as well. So it's these themes that really brought us together here at this masterclass that we had in this very room, as Niels mentioned, where cities from the CCD network um, came together, shared stories of their um, work, ambitions, hopes, uh, opportunities, and challenges in their, uh, in their home city and began to learn from one another to hopefully begin to take action on uh, some of these issues that we've been talking about. Just today, we've la launched this uh, website, Thriving Foodscapes. You can scan the QR code there to check it out. And this is a landing page and an online resource for not only case studies like the ones I've shown, but also tools to help take this understanding to your neighborhood or your community, understand what's really going on, and then hopefully use that insight to make real change and real um, action. Uh, for communities in need. So with that sort of overarching intro, I'll also turn it over to Louisa and I'll pull up your slides while you get situated. Yes, and if you, if I can borrow your computer. Oh yeah, so that I can see that's a good idea. Horizon. You can also have it here. No, but it's not Great. Well, thank you very much. And I think it's really a pleasure for me to be here today, as I said before, and to contribute to this very, very important uh, conversation. Just as a, as a way of introduction, a UNICEF Global Nutrition Strategy focuses on addressing malnutrition in all its forms, including overweight and obesity. Um, and one of the key elements of the strategy calls to strengthen the capacity and the accountability of five key systems, which are food, health, water and sanitation, education, and social protection. And within all of that, we do understand and we promote that to achieve sustainable results for better nutrition for children, we need to apply, or the world need to apply a systemic approach to integrate the five system. So urban food environment are definitely part of a broader food system. And I think I'll take a lot of what has been said and I'll bring it down now with the focus, zooming in on children, although a lot of the information that you've given Jeff uh, was targeting that, which is great. So just a bit of uh, context. There has been in Latin America and the Caribbean a rise in childhood obesity. Um, over time uh, to the point that um, there is agreement that this has become a public health concern. Uh, for example, in here I'm having some regional data, 7.5% of younger children and under the age of five are affected by uh, overweight and obesity. And 30% of children and adolescents between five and 19 years are affected by overweight and obesity. Uh, one that one information is not here is, uh, and I want I want to, to stress this is that if we disaggregate the data, uh, it is clear that the most disadvantaged children, if we look at quintile or other elements of their socioeconomical situation, are more prone to be affected by this, which maybe is not intuitive, uh, especially in this region where there is still this sometimes belief that you know. Uh, overweight is it's good culturally uh, but we do know that this is a problem and is um, more targeted there we also know as i said before that if we look at this uh, we move away from the understanding that this problem is the fault of the individual the children or the caretakers but are they are the result of an entire food system that's failing children and that's why this conversation today is particularly important. And this is, and, and that's why it's so important that at this table, we not only have public health experts, but also other stakeholders that can make the right changes. Now, just to exemplify, I see if I can treat you an, an imaginary, but very real um, problem. Uh, what happens to um, a boy or a girl uh, during their day, which can have an effect, an effect in their adequate nutrition and health. So typically, um, a child is being accompanied by their parents 
uh, they are going uh, to school, oftentimes most disadvantaged walking for a long time in a condition that is maybe not, not the most safe or appropriate. Um, they should have snacks for their uh, day, but often the availability of healthy food is not there, not all the time, not, not when it's needed. Uh, plus is not affordable as Jeff rightly mentioned. Uh, the kids get to school, their parents often use the, we use the public transportation to get to the work. Um, and then uh, the kids are being picked, picked up often by other members of the family or other, other people. Um, they go home uh, through uh, a situation that may not be the best for them to not just to walk, but to, to spend time or to wait, uh, playing with their friends. Then again, um, the, the provision of healthy food or accessibility is not there. And the walk home may be also uh, dangerous in um, situations that are not well lit and they put their safety at risk. Of course, this is an exaggeration and I'm, I'm just doing so to make a point, um, but we do see some of these elements often in, in several cities in, in this region. So if you look at this then, if we want the children in this region, but broadly, to grow in food environments uh, that take into account their health and nutrition, uh, then we are advocating governments to look into four different areas of implementation. And as a matter of fact, I must say that this region has moved uh, quite fast in implementation, in, um, in developing and implementing laws and policies they try to, to look at prevention of uh, overweight and obesity. For example, taxation of sugar drinks, uh, front of packet labeling, uh, being Argentina, one of those countries, uh, restrictions of marketing of unhealthy food and so forth. Um, I guess the proposal now is also look at what happens at the local level, which again was the point that I think uh, both my predecessor were making, what are the changes, integral changes needed where uh, the kids reside, which is mostly in, in urban areas in this region. So this is a, a bit of visualization of, of the four area. We are talking about political will. We are talking about the social environment. We're talking about food environment and cultural and eating patterns. And we are going talking about building space and urban character. And I will go a bit into detail of each one quickly. Um, and then just uh, advertisement. All of what I'm saying is uh, in great details in a document that has been shared with the organizer and can be shared uh, with you. Um, there will be much more examples and, and useful tips, I think, in relation to all of this. But um, let's go through this quickly. So the first one, governance and political will. So basically the point being is what we want is to redesign the public spaces to increase the availability of fresh food, uh, further regulation of ultra processed food, for example, marketing, for example, the impossibility to market at school, close to school where kids are waiting for their bus and so forth, uh, improvement of recreational spaces for children, um, and then other ideas like the ones that were already shared in terms of what is being done with the surplus of the food in, plug in past public spaces and so forth. All of these changes do require political will. Oops. The second point, food environment and cultural eating patterns. Um, and there, um, there are some examples in terms of banning marketing, as I was saying. For example, something that I think is less implemented in the region is banning those in public transportation. Um, looking at the issue of installing free drinking water fountains so that the consumption of water is put forward rather than uh, unhealthy uh, drinks. And it's more accessible, as we are saying. Oftentimes in Latin America, uh, water is that unhealthy uh, drinks. 
Um, and if we go to the third block, which is building space and uh, urban character, um, we are looking then at the interaction, as Jeff was saying, the interaction between the space and the food systems uh, and how, where the kids are living. So, for example, redesigning public spaces all around the schools, um, having programs that ensure that uh, kids can and, and parents can bike to school, for instance, and there are programs that they teach. Uh, kids and their caregiver to bike. Uh, in some cases, like in Argentina, this is a given. In other places, it's less so. And for lastly, social environment. Um, for example, looking at what care uh, takers and the, the same very children know about food uh, and supporting them to know what healthy uh, eating means. Um, and that could be done in, in um, more contemporary ways, for example, with the pups for children. Um, what we want is we know children are amazing agents of change. We want our kids to come home and tell us parents, mm -mm, this is not what I should be eating. This is what I should be eating. Or this is not uh, what you should put on my, uh, on my plate. And that, that is, I think, what they can do and, and actually very well if they know it, if they are supported. So I, again, I think the conclusion I'm coming to is obvious. I show you the same round, but in a scenario where um, the kids are going to school with their parents, they're going into through a proper space, maybe biking, uh, if that possibility is there, they can pick up a, a fruit on the way to school. Uh, they can ensure that when they come to school, um, they, they, they are safe, there is no publicity, that shouldn't be there, um, and then they're being picked up. They can play around with their, their friends in a safe uh, environment that on the top of everything else, it would incentivate the physical activity, which is also very important in this matter. And they can go home with their parents um, through well-lit roads that ensure their safety and security. And with this, I thank you very much. Uh, and uh, here are some contacts. And again, uh, we'll make sure that if you're interested, we'll distribute the documents. Well, though, this is much better explained than I could do in 10 minutes. Thank you. Wonderful. Ida, how do you view these this issue? <laughs> Well, I'm from public government, so I didn't uh, bring slides. That's <laughs> <laughs> a format on uh, familiar to us. So, um, uh, healthy, affordable, inclusive, culturally appropriate, sustainable. That sounds very expensive, right? If you're uh, in a financial department like uh, like I am. Um, but the good news is that what we proved in Copenhagen is that this is actually achievable uh, and if you go all the way it's also cheaper so let me just start off by setting the stage in terms of Copenhagen we are a small fairy tale city and I must say that being here I some feel very privileged because obviously we've had advantages uh, starting this agenda very early on in Copenhagen we are 600,000 inhabitants and on a daily basis we serve 70,000 public meals uh, Fifty percent of which is some meals that we serve to children, uh, 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 citizens below the age of eighteen, more like sixteen. Uh, our current uh, food system, uh, public food system, is eighty-five percent organic, uh, and that's something that we take very much pride in. Um, working with food has been a long-standing tradition in Copenhagen. Uh, school food, for instance, is not mandatory in Denmark, so it's a, a, a result of a political wish and will to, to push for more healthy and, and, and inclusive uh, food options for all in Copenhagen. And in 2019, uh, after working with this topic for almost 20 years, we decided to do a food strategy. So I'm also here to tell you, you don't need strategies to, to change your food system, but uh, sometimes it can help. Um, and for us, the food strategy is mainly an addition to what we've already been working with. So we have now also the ambition to 
cut our greenhouse gas emissions by 25% per kilo procured food by 2025. Well, it's a tricky sentence. Um, still keeping our goal of 90% organic and cutting food waste by 50% uh, by 2030. So that's our sort of uh, the background. Uh, and then I guess the question is, how does the food system in Copenhagen work then? Uh, first of all, uh, it's meant to be for everyone, and, and it surely is, so it's a collective effort. So if you're in a kindergarten or daycare, uh, the parents group will vote uh, every four years whether or not they want to keep a food option uh, in the kindergarten. Um, I think the vote now is almost 90% vote, yes, please do serve food for our children, don't make us do lunches. Uh, in school, we have two different systems, so either you pay per day uh, uh, or you pay by the month. Um, and if you're a low-income family, you can uh, apply for funding from the city, so it can be uh, subsidized. Uh, and it's something that it all takes place back end, so if you're the person receiving the subsidized uh, food, uh, you, it, it won't be visible uh, to you. So in that way, we also been quite conscious of not creating stigma or social stigma uh, between the, um, the uh, pupils. Uh, the self-financing element of uh, the school food, oh wow, uh, is somewhere in between two and five, two point five four dollars per meal. Um, and actually, just this year's budget negotiation in Copenhagen has just been finalized, and they set aside further funds to actually keep the price at its current stage, even though inflation, of course, also for us means that that, that the, um, producing the meals uh, has gone um, uh, a bit more expensive. Then the main point of how we work is that there are a few people like me, city strategize policy people engaged and everything happens entering through the kitchen door because our observation is at the end of the day, uh, the main person uh, responsible for how healthy or tasty or sustainable the meal is, is the one cooking it. Uh, so that's where we are going. So we are there with education and training and guidance, status, reports, baselines and whatever. So that's where we spent primarily uh, of the funding that goes into this program. And what that does is that it creates better food, healthier food, more sustainable food. It also enhances quality of work. At the end of the day, it's way more fun going to work, actually using your skill set as a trained food professional than it is using your scissor to open up bags and then fry whatever in it. Um, and it also makes it easier for us to actually achieve the goals that we set out for this system. role of being 90% organic now I think for almost 10 years we've been almost there so at a percentage between 85 87 percent so at the current moment it's not really necessary for us to push for our getting their agenda it's more like a staying there which is a different uh, um, uh, system that we uh, should uh, push for in the kitchens and then there's also another thing, because when Copenhagen has been working with this for so many years, there are no more low-hanging fruits uh, available to us. Now it's all the tricky ones available. And we are here uh, in Buenos Aires at a summit uh, on international collaboration. And for me, that this uh, has been such a wonderful group being part of for many years, because in Copenhagen, to be honest, it's a quite homogenic uh, society and social diversity is not as high as it is seen anywhere else. So I think also we might have been a bit uh, blind to the fact that even in Copenhagen, there are all, also many, many different uh, uh, contexts that uh, you operate in if you are an institution serving food. Um, so one of the things that we did is that we, um, instead of having like one program that either you were in it or you were not in it, uh, we diversified um, the the uh, courses and, and the, the reports and the training that you can access so that you can now access even small bits of it. Because if you're in an in institution in a relatively deprived neighborhood, or if you're working with, for instance, eating disorder uh, 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 young, youngsters, it's more tricky for you to be like, okay, yeah, we're going to set aside one and a half year and do like focus training on every topic, but maybe it's easier just to access uh, one thing and then build from there. 
Um, also, we are now facing of what I think is a problem almost worldwide recruiting. <laughs> uh, it's just not uh, as easy uh, getting uh, uh, well-trained professional staff into our kitchen. So that's also another reality that we need to focus if we want to maintain the, uh, the, uh, the, the belief that, that those are the people actually making this uh, scene happen. Um, then we develop support systems. So we have uh, guidelines. Uh, if we are extracting uh, red meat and shifting to, to a more health, healthy and sustainable diet, uh, then what does what comes instead? So we actually did a quite a large research-based um, setup uh, looking at, okay, so if we want to have organic uh, meals and we want them to be uh, healthy and sustainable, we want them to meet all the nutritional guidelines, we want them to be affordable, uh, and we want them to take departure in a Danish eating culture, then what's you know available to us? Uh, where, where, what can we purchase? Uh, lots of fruits, uh, lots of nuts, lots of... Uh, different uh, green, uh, 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 dark green vegetables, lots of lentils. Um, and those are all things that you are maybe not familiar working with and you don't know how, how much amount of lentils will so, uh, would come instead of, uh, of uh, red meat, for instance. Um, so, so that's something that we've been working with. And that's a very specific concrete support tool in the kitchen, but it also a very nice policy tool for us because when we talk about reducing greenhouse gas emissions from, from um, from the kitchens, it very uh, uh, quickly becomes a discussion of whether or not we're taking away uh, meat from elderly people who really need it. <laughs> so, so, so it, it, it's a political sensitive thing, and it's very uh, important to us to have like research-based uh, uh, guidelines to 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 go to, so 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 we can sort of de uh, demystify uh, the conversation. Then, then we all have a, a big online recipe tool that, that you can use. Uh, so if you're uh, um, uh, cooking in, in one of our uh, institutions, you can log on and then you can say, okay, I'm going to cook uh, 150 meals today uh, for a healthy elderly. Um, and then you can have recipes that are se seasonal based and, and based on the Eat Lancet guidelines. Um, so, so it's all available to you, and it's in season, um, and it's uh, amounts to to the exact number of uh, portions that you're cooking. And then another support tool that we do is that we try to celebrate the food system in Copenhagen the best we can. Uh, one time every year, we have a big party for everyone who's employed in our kitchens where we cook for them instead of having them cook for us uh, and the mayors will be attending and we will uh, work with them and 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 thank thank them for for, for cooking every day uh, and we recently also did something called uh, uh, come eat with us uh, so doing a copenhagen uh, festival called copenhagen cooking uh, you can uh, now order tickets you can go to either an elderly home or school uh, to have uh, the meal uh, that they cook there, uh, meet the children, meet the chefs, meet the, the, the manager of the place and, and get familiar with how, how the, the public uh, food system uh, works. And then the last thing is probably the most important thing of how the system works is that we invite the people eating into the kitchen. So if you're in an elderly home, uh, you need to uh, sense the food before eating it because it enhances appetite, it creates joy, and it's a social uh, uh, experience um, that really motivates and stimulates uh, the pe uh, people in an elderly home, for instance. Or if you're a child in a school, you need to go there to learn how to cook. It's very well that we want to serve them healthy and nutritional uh, and uh, sustainable meals, but we also need them to know what a pointed cabbage is and how to use a knife, uh, because that's a very important skill set if they are to venture out in, in life and have, uh, have the competency to, 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 to bring this with them. Uh, but that also enhances food courage, so it's easier to eat uh, uh, cauliflower or mackerel if you've just been in the kitchen uh, cooking it yourself. Uh, and then there's an opportunity for the schools and institutions to adapt to um, the the people, the children, and their, their backgrounds and culture. So we will see definitely that where we have, uh, for instance, more uh, refugees or other that's uh, in the, um, the the kitchens. This also creates a platform to them to tell about their homeland and their experiences. So so we've re really seen that that inviting them in and engaging with them unlocks so much potential for other types of uh, exchanges. 
So what's next? <laughs> I feel like uh, maybe local government shouldn't be everywhere in your life, but sometimes it's like we have these uh, children with us until the age of 16, uh, and then we let them go and we only see them again when they are very old or very sick. Uh, and, um, and and that's probably good. Um, uh, but uh, but but next up for us is definitely exploring further how we are engaging with communities and with the public space in terms of uh, also uh, being aware that that the the everyday life of citizens in Copenhagen is so meaningful in terms of better health and, and sustainability. That's where yeah. our shifting urban diets that that Jeff were, were just, uh, giving some example on uh, earlier is so important. And um, also in the city of Copenhagen, we are currently working on developing our new climate action plan, where we will have, as it looks now, and uh, a goal of uh, lowering consumption-based emission with 50% uh, uh, by 2035. Um, so food there often obviously being the single largest component uh, of doing so. So I'm just looking forward to exploring further. Thank you. Wonderful. So in the spirit of exploring further, I just want to uh, take a little bit of time here to ask you all some questions. And uh, I'd like to start with the money. So Nils, you mentioned, of course, uh, the world or global food consumption, it's, it's big business, it's $9 trillion, but the health and climate costs make it a net minus 10 trillion. Ida, you mentioned, hey, limited budget to do all these different things, but there seems to be a uh, gaping hole in the food system that's not efficient, that maybe can may be made more efficient. And I wonder also if, from your point of view, Louisa, what, if UNICEF is taking any, um, any steps in this economic question, but I just want to turn it over to you three to, to address the opportunity. Are we doing enough to talk about this economic impact? Should we be doing more and how might we frame it in a way that could get maybe more political traction? Yeah, Nils, go ahead. So this this is the tomorrow the or this afternoon the C forty summit will start, and a number of uh, of mayors who uh, have climate and health and food on their agenda will be be joining. and And I think it's a, it's a good opportunity to instill courage in them, because one of the big frustrations none of us are politicians, but we work closely uh, or in the rim of uh, of politics. And and it's sometimes politicians lose courage when it comes to uh, to taking action on on some of, some of these things, when the net uh, contribution of food system is is minus ten trillion, um, you know that's that's what is normally something we call market failure. And what do we do with market failure? We regulate. I mean, we do that uh, across sectors. So so it's I mean it's not really that difficult, but often uh, regulation of something that is so essential to our well-being, nam namely food, is seen as taking away choice. And that's not a good thing uh, as it's perceived, but but uh, so, so uh, yeah, so how could we address that? I think there's a, a couple of opportunities. Uh, first of all, COVID-19 is still fresh in mind. And we, we, I think some of us remember what it is not to have uh, good health or access to health services when we need them, and and in that you know that might be a gateway to say there's probably some other things that we we can we can can and should should uh, uh, address. Uh, I actually think the private sector, uh, even the evil part of the private sector, um, might uh, might actually be contributing here because. Private sector is not inherently evil. I just think the private sector wants to have a level playing field. When it comes to, for example, in Europe to abandoning uh, 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 dangerous chemicals, there is a EU-wide uh, system called REACH, where there's a process for eliminating those chemicals over time and sets a high, higher bar. And, and private sector and businesses, you know, uh, uh, over a decade comply with those. And it actually has that follow-on effect that if the Americans or the Chinese wants to export to Europe, they also need to be you know, compliant with that. 
can we find something for food uh, in, in that area as we have for dangerous chemicals? What would be those three, four, five uh, basic standards that everyone would live up to? And then we could compete on that, uh, that ground. Maybe that would be a way. On a very practical way, it's also, you know, the challenge of where do you start? And, and, uh, and I think the foodscapes uh, tool that, uh, that, that was presented earlier is actually a way to unpack the problem. It, it, will, it will help you to understand whether is this an issue of access? Is it an issue of, of the supply chain? Is it an issue of affordability or sustainability or a mix of those? And what would be that combination? So going out and observing uh, what, what is actually here, uh, actually there, and then devising a plan for, for how you actually can, can address that at the local level. But, but I, you know, I think we need to both uh, you know, address it from the top as well as from the bottom. Thanks. Yeah. Nice. Ida, what do you say? Um, yeah, I agree. <laughs> uh, I think one of the challenges here is also that this really cuts across so many different levels of uh, government. Uh, like we have local uh, government and we have uh, regional government, that's all the healthcare systems in Denmark, then we have national legislation and then we have the EU legislation. So it, it's very, very tricky figuring out where to point your finger and say this is where initiative should come from. Uh, so of course that again comes back to events like this where we bring every uh, everyone together is uh, super important, but still what do we do when we come home and who who, who kind of ha have the ball uh, there is, uh, I, I still find that very confusing. Anyway, I think from, from a local perspective, sometimes it's also making what seems very unapproachable, very easy. Uh, so in Copenhagen, if we look at greenhouse gas emission co uh, co reductions, 46% of our greenhouse gas emissions from food comes from uh, red meat. Red meat only is 3% of the ton of food that we procure. So it's such a small person uh, portion that if we take that out of the system, we really came quite far. And I think you would see similar uh, um, uh, probably uh, uh, cases uh, elsewhere. So, so when you look at it, changing 3% of your procurement, that's, you know, that's doable. Uh, if we look at food waste, for instance, which is also a, a really heavily waste of money in every, uh, and resources in every, any way, it's 55% of the waste that we have in Copenhagen come from the meal, so which is a meal that we've done that hasn't been eaten. So either we should make them smaller, <laughs> we should make them better. <laughs> you know, it's it's very much on focusing on what's on the plate and that will get, get, get us very, very far. So I am just saying that, yes, we need frameworks and regulation and collaboration that supports this. But also if you're local and, and if you're working with this, there's so many way, ways that you can just start and it will get you to, to, to a certain point. Yeah. So, uh, Louisa, I want to give you a chance to answer the economic question, but I also want to ask what Ida just mentioned about red meat. And also in the Argentinian context, <laughs> there's obviously some cultural uh, issues here where maybe it might not be that big of a deal in Copenhagen to take that away. Maybe it would be in another context. So you can feel free to talk about anything you want, but especially maybe the red meat question in a place like Argentina and, of course, the economics of, uh, of this challenge that we mentioned. Thank you. I, I just want to go back to the to the previous question, which is which is broader. And although I don't have numbers right now, um, and I'm sure a colleague would have, uh, but I think there is something that we do know and is clear. If you think at what uh, overweight in children means and what it entails in terms of the increase of likelihood of non-communicable diseases. Uh, cardiovascular diseases, diabetes, cancer, and so forth. If you add to that, that um, overweight and obesity have effect on mental and emotional well-being, that re it's proven to reduce uh, the learning um, opportunity um, of kids and hence having an impact on their economic revenues as an adult. If you take all of that, and you think about what would be the cost of investing on prevention through this integrated system that we've all been talking about. Uh, and what are the costs that states are already incurring for not preventing in terms of all I said, uh, in terms of 
the cost for the states for uh, the health uh, care uh, of the adults that those ki kids were. I think there is a clear rationale and well proven that it's well preventive is well worth the investment. So I think even without numbers, I think this is clear, this is proven. And I think if I go back, we go back to what I mentioned before, and I take your second part, your second question into that. I think it is also clear that to, to be successful uh, in approaching this problem, as well as many other uh, collateral issues that having a, a, a proper foolscape, uh, as, as we have been discussing, other benefits that it would bring to children in terms of their safety, as I said, mentioned before, and many other things. Um, I think we need to go back to the four big areas that needs to be approached. And so it, it's obviously an issue of regulation, but as uh, it was very interesting for me to hear the, the, the presentation for Copenhagen, because it's clear in, in all of that, there will be um, bottlenecks. And then, you know, you need to be creative and, and go around those in those four areas. One of them being the cultural norms um, and what in each country in their own ways, um, the interpretation of the uh, understanding of uh, food and, and, and appropriate, adequate, uh, healthy food means. Um, and I wouldn't enter into the, that specific issue that you spoke about, but equally you can find different uh, different um, a predisposition or different customs um, that are often tight. And I want to go back to what you said in your presentation, because I think, um, and, and what I mentioned before, we shouldn't put the finger, point the finger to the customer, right? For what they eat. Uh, because they, this is done in a context which is cultural, and also what is being said, it is done in a context of the economic possibility that those um, that those families have. So I think you all go back to to the, the holistic look that uh, is required for us to approach this, and I think there is no doubt uh, that working on this uh, is the best return for investment that any government uh, can do. Nice. So just picking up on a couple of other things that you all mentioned um, there in terms of um, culture, obviously, uh, also this this question of, you mentioned, Louisa, caretakers. And I think one thing we found in our work is that not all caretakers are the same. And they're actually in different cultures might be very, very specific gender issues or the age of caretakers also plays a role in this. So one thing we're learning uh, is that maybe it's been typical to try to um, target mothers, typically, who stereotypically might be making the food, but especially in Latin America, it might be more interesting to engage with fathers who oftentimes are the ones that decide what meal is cooked or what food is bought. And so I'm curious for any of you to talk about any thoughts on either caretakers or the gender issues that might arise in, in this question of healthy food eating, uh, how we might differentiate between the different stakeholders that we're talking with, with some of these ideas in mind. Any thoughts on that? Yeah. Um, if, if we are talking about caretakers as the professional caretakers in the public uh, institutions, then I do have um, a small reflection. So. What is very uh, obvious to us is that the meal situation is very, very important. Uh, it has to be safe and it has to be social. It has to be um, engaging, uh, even coming uh, back to if we're in, uh, in daycare, um, we serve meal, uh, we serve the food in, in smaller uh, uh, sizes, and but then it's still the, even it's a two-year-old who, who takes the food from the, uh, the bowl to his plate uh, as, an, uh, as a part of him having agency. Um, and, and for us, it's been very important to, to look at not only the kitchen staff, uh, but also at the, um, the the staff around the people when eating, uh, having them on board in the training courses as well, having management on board, because here it also uh, is a question of how much time do you spend uh, 
eating a meal. Uh, I think what we see in, in the, the, the schools uh, is that there's so little time. So it's very, very difficult to have a very sense, uh, meaningful uh, eating uh, uh, session taking place. Um, and that's why we need to bring also the food into the, the everyday practices of the school. Uh, and I think we have a great opportunity to do so because we also want people in schools to actually have actual skill sets when coming out of the school. So so, so I think food and, and everyday food and school food is, is a, a very great opportunity for that but just saying that that what we definitely see is that you need to look at so many people uh, in the sort of the value chain around uh, the the whole food uh, meal system um, that's important for it to have impact the way we want it to yeah nice I was actually thinking it's a it's a great angle I was thinking of more caretakers about maybe mothers or fathers or grandparents or whatever but I love you brought in the other caretakers yeah, yeah. sorry I'm from Scandinavia yeah, yeah. <laughs> we, we, we uh, <laughs> that's what we do yeah. Actually, I yes I think uh yes I would add because I was I would be going in a similar direction mm. uh, and and I was reflecting on a question two things one is um why obviously family and and you know, is, is fundamental um, but I was thinking we are looking at who is a child spending most time with uh, and who has the responsibility um, of their feeding in different contexts at different time of the day so on one end I would say I would also say it is important that the capacity uh, the um, the training whenever needed uh, and the, the opportunities to, to have, uh, for instance, in, in the case of schools and school, school meals, which is uh, often used in many countries, also in, in this region, uh, needs to be there. So I broaden and I think it's important to do so. Um, and on the other end, you raise a very good point, which as UNICEF we are trying to raise, especially if we think about early childhood, that importance in this space in the first years of a child life, of um, of the the family and the share of the the uh, involvement uh, of the different caretakers, including mother, fathers, or in whichever uh, setting the family is composed. Mm -hmm. uh, and hence, this is another topic. But I think there is a very close relation because a lot of what we were talking about in, in terms of food systems can be easily and better implemented in societies of care, as we like to call, or in, in society in, in countries where there is uh, the, the possibility um, that the care is being um, looked at as an investment again. And for instance, and this is something here in, in Argentina, we have been advocating for and worked with the government to promote um, laws that ensure that mothers and fathers can equally take care of children, including hence all the steps that, that we are talking about, which is not just food preparation, but the right space for playing, uh, the opportunity to, to have physical um, exercise, it's, it's all together. And lastly, if I may, and I want to go back to something that Neil said, which I think is important and we really embrace, what is the role of all the different stakeholders when we talk about food, foodscape and food systems. And, and we totally agree that, again, because of the different um, parts of a, a strategy that needs to be so holistic, it is very important that not just the government and not just certain ministries, but various ministries, but also the society, also the private sector, um, also in, in countries where, of course, the, the United Nations are there, ourselves and, and UNICEF in this case, that we all work together. Uh, and I think it is, um, it is essential because uh, only when there is the involvement, engagement, the commitment of the different stakeholders, I think uh, there, there will be a real change as you're showing, for example, from, from Copenhagen. Nice, yeah, let's yeah, go so, so I'm a, an economist, and economists are typically ones that, you know, we, we will just go ahead and implement stuff and not necessarily being concerned about the fallout of, uh, of things. But if there's one thing that I've learned in the eight, more than eight years that I've been working with cities uh, changing diabetes is the appreciation of understanding 
both the social context and the cultural context. And and I think while it's difficult, I think that we can, uh, from a policy perspective, apply structural change to some of those social determinants of health. You know, we can improve employment, we can improve housing, we can improve access to education, and so on. I mean, those are things that are within within uh, you know our our ability to act. But if we don't understand culture, we will probably fail. Mm. And, and just an interesting anecdote that I remember from uh, some of the anthropological work that we did in China was that, uh, and, and comes back to, uh, to, to the role of caregivers, uh, since many grandparents are caregivers of their grandchild, typically the one, um, um, we, we found that in, in some families that the memory of hunger played a role. Mm. In the, in, in the way that the parents or the grandparents approached nutrition, because they were old enough to have remembered the cultural revolution, famines, and so on. And it was such a deeply held belief that never again mm. uh, played a role in how they, uh, you know, took care of their grandchild. And also that played into the the food, mm -hmm. uh, the both the type of it and, and also the, uh, the amount of it uh, that this child would never starve again. Uh, or would I mean we, we would never yeah. experience starvation again, and 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 I don't think if you don't understand that or don't bring that into you the way that you uh, identify solutions, then you're probably bound to and certainly not solve the whole problem. Yeah, yeah, super interesting. Uh, Ida, you wanted to plug in there too. Yeah, but I was just uh, motivated by the question of culture. <laughs> so sorry if I'm. Uh misleading here okay um so we definitely see the same thing there's like a an integral uh idea that uh, whenever you get old enough you just want mashed potatoes and whipped cream uh and and we've really been trying to start a conversation do you maybe could is it so that elderly people in let's say 10 years time from now might want something else i mean okay if you have troubles chewing that's another question but if you're like a healthy functional elderly person maybe there there, there are things that are happening now in in this uh, uh in this era that you will bring into your uh, uh, uh your life when when you get older as well and 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 those i think is uh, very tricky conversations that uh, we haven't unlocked uh, either so just point. yeah great point um cool so i'm curious if anyone there there's a one question online i could go to but does anyone in the uh audience have a question to ask of any of the folks up here all right i think now we look very scary sitting here but yes exactly we are very scary up here one um one very particular question but i want to ask from samuel korea online it was it's a very particular but interesting one about the availability of organic food in latin america um seeing that it, it oftentimes we mentioned cost being so important um organic farming practices drastically raising the price making it in even more unavailable luisa or anyone are you aware of any organic successful organic farming practices that are economically viable there you you take me unprepared i my colleagues from the regional office are online and i don't know if uh, normally we work together with fao yeah. uh, and fao are the ones who are looking at this i can hear for example it is it's not answering the question so but i'm just giving an example of something that yes i do know yeah. <laughs> uh in uh, in argentina for example we work with the food uh, fao um in in some areas to ensure the, the uh, growth of organic uh, food by local community, so food that is traditional in certain areas, uh, and as well as with you and men, you and women, in terms of looking at um, the female um, added um, families and how they play a role in those. This is something that they're mostly doing. But beyond that, unfortunately, I don't have uh, specific data. I don't know if. Um, if colleagues are there, I, I suggest, and they have more, I suggest maybe they put it in the chat and maybe we can give them the... Wonderful. That's fair. Thanks. Um, well, I think we can, you know, begin to wrap things up, uh, but I'd love to just get some thoughts. You know, here you represent public, private, um, international organization sectors. We've been talking about collaboration. Um, you've mentioned a little bit, but would you have any 
um, maybe hopes or wishes for uh, ways to remove barriers to collaboration going forward, uh, types of collaboration that you wish might be able to happen, or any tricks or, or tips for making collaboration work across these sectors that you might want to share? That's a very big question, <laughs> Jeff, you know that, right? <laughs> you're only asking because you're not answering. Yeah. Um, well, <laughs> uh, first of all, uh, we obviously just need to keep the conversation going. And I think coming from that, we will find concrete, specific ways to meet up and collaborate. So Nils and I actually had a, co a collaboration this year when uh, Copenhagen was hosting the, the Grand Depart of the Tour de France. Uh, and we did a two day uh, cycle festival in Copenhagen. Uh, Novo Nordisk being there, uh, engaging uh, uh, in the conversation on healthy and playful uh, everyday behavior, uh, and and setting the scene also made it uh, possible for us at, as the city administration to um, to engage with uh, the food suppliers at the festival scene uh, to have them have uh, planned forward uh, options uh, as a main course uh, for what they were serving. And what it actually sh uh, showed afterwards in the evaluation is that everyone was so happy that they were serving other stuff than, you know, hamburgers and, and, and beers, uh, which is what we usually uh, see in festival settings. So I think uh, that's just a great example of how sometimes we need to have the very broad, very tricky, holistic uh, departure conversations that we have today. But then at the end of the day, it's the everyday practices and, and, and the relations that we build here uh, gives us opportunity to, to, to move forward with the concrete projects afterwards. Yeah, let's go ahead. Um, maybe I'm not the right one to, uh, I mean, I won't uh, give advice either to the public sector or international organizations, but for the private sector, I think a piece of advice that we have learned a lot from is uh, when you go into these, you know, new, uh, types of collaborations with partners that don't look like yourself. Don't go in with a preconceived idea about your, what you want to do. Don't come in with hypothesis uh, beforehand, but, but you know, use the time, uh, build the evidence around what that hypothesis is so you can, uh, or what, what you want to do together rather than coming in with a, you know, truckload of, uh, of, of good intentions and, and things you want to do take a step back and and use that opportunity listening a little bit more to uh, the experiences of others be that civil society organizations the community forces and and others because they might actually have the solution to some of the challenges that you are seeing but you don't know to, how to solve so so that would be a piece of advice to uh, at least for for private sector who is uh, typically have a very fixed idea and then we you know we uh, march forward and, and try to implement as uh, as uh, forceful as possible. Yeah. Nice. Louisa, anything to add on collaboration from your end? Yeah. Well, if you, I already expressed the the importance and the value that of partnership across trade stakeholders. Maybe I take this opportunity to thank uh, Novo Dorby in particular, Niels, and also Gels to be an implementing partner. Uh, we were commenting before that uh, the Thanks to this partnership, UNICEF involvement in this agenda and our knowledge and capacity to then, as you just said, be at the table and bring the ideas and trying to influence and discuss openly has grown uh, extremely. Um, we have started implementing several activities, both at an advocacy and then implementation level to prove what is working in various countries. Um, so I just want to use this opportunity to to thank uh, Novo Nordis for this, uh, hoping that this is the first step of something that will continue and grow um, in, in the right direction. Thank you. Wonderful. I think that's uh, some very nice ways to sum up. Uh, you know, I think this uh, idea of being humble um, in all of our respective points of view, uh, listening and learning from communities from real uh, from real people in real places, um, paying attention to the big strategy, but getting the small details right, as you mentioned very pragmatically, um, Ida. And I think for me, thinking about this and all these strategies and big money and, and, and also being able to understand some very fundamental elements of being human, like when we make our food, it helps us digest it better. Uh, or when we uh, prepare the food, it gives us more appetite as an elderly person. I think also keeping those very human um, 
elements in mind as we think about international collaboration and public private is uh, is actually quite both um, a challenge, but also quite lovely to know that it boils down to some of these fundamental human characteristics that we all share, regardless of that culture. So I again want to thank um, thank you all. Uh, thank Cities Changing Diabetes, Novo, C40, all of you here and online. Uh, it's a real pleasure. Thank you for joining us and hope you enjoy the rest of your day wherever you might be. Thank you. <laughs> 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 As it is, we all came up. They, 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 they.